Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What's up, Michael? Happy Thursday. Everything good? Everything's good. Good, man. Uh, you got complimented on your eyes, uh, just so you know. And uh, I didn't – I know this sounds weird, but I haven't noticed until now. You do have, um, like, really dreamy eyes. Um, go to our website if you want to check out <laughs> Michael's dreamy <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Our social media people are uh, fiddling with buttons. Taylor, what are you doing out there? I don't know. I think she can't hear us. She can't hear us, and that, that's what they're doing. Mm, figured. Um, our guest today is Aaron Pruner from Pruner TV at Adobe Radio. Um, I'm really excited to have him on. Um, he's a really cool cat. I was on his show a while ago, and it was just a blast talking with him. His podcast mainly deals with TV-related things. And he's very sarcastic, very humorous, and I can't wait to talk to him about life in general because I really don't know him. I don't know who he is, and um, I just know him from that one interview, and so it's going to be cool seeing what things we learned about Aaron Pruner today. So ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Aaron Pruner. You like this, Aaron? I, I dig it. Yeah, yeah. It brings me back to my Rastafari and uh, <laughs> uh, trip hop days. Um, okay, so you're actually smiling now, but just yeah. like literally five seconds ago, before the music started, you were furious because of your coffee. So back in the day, I used to have the nickname Mr. Furious because there was one time I looked like Ben Stiller. So thank you. <laughs> you're I'm, I am not kidding. That's true. That's a true story. They called you Mr. Furious. Okay. Oh yeah, from Mystery Men. The, the movie Mystery Men. The character oh Ben Stiller. Oh my Played yes. in this. I'm a lot older than you, so I have different references. Not by much. By enough. <laughs> so trust me. By enough. <laughs> Should I thank the listeners for tuning in to We Sam's World? Uh, nah, you can do okay. it later. All I right. mean, I guess you're good. I mean, I'm not getting paid for this. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to Pruner TV. You're getting... Uh, no? Yeah, you can do that. All right, cool. Yeah, you did it. And I did. then, all right, you we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> That's the whole I'm going to go back home and go back to sleep. Yeah, so you're talking about this iced yeah. coffee. We live in a city that can charge really a lot of money for iced coffee if they put it in a fancy jar. You said it would cost more because they wanted to put it in a mason jar. I, I, I went to this place in Santa Monica yesterday. I'm not going to say what the name the, name of the place because, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a cool location, and I went there to meet a friend for a, um, a homework assignment I'm doing. Right. And I ordered cold brew, and it was like $6 for a small, but you got to put it in a fancy-looking jar to drink out of. Six dollars for a small like cold nitro brew. brew or a cold just a cold brew, not yeah. even a nitro brew. No, oh, that's pretty expensive actually. Yeah, and I'm like, is it because the jar's cool? Like, what? I make my own cold brew at home usually, by the sure. way, uh, but I I haven't had the time to. do You know that. what it is? Because Santa Monica is so fucking expensive. They have to like as a business, you have to make sure like whatever the cost is, it has to be three times as much. Well, like, that's, a, that's like the business plan. It's stupid. It is. So you can imagine how much – how expensive like rent is in Santa Monica. Yeah. Oh, I know how expensive With that location, is. I don't know what the place is, but I can only assume that it was a it pretty was decent location. It was not far from 3rd Street. Okay, then. it's uh, On Wilshire. Um, but, yeah, like I, I knew someone who used to live in Santa Monica, and they had a one-bedroom apartment for something like $3,000 yeah. a month. Yeah. That is more than what my two-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment goes for. What area of town do you live in? I live 10 minutes from here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so North Hollywood area? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, li- I live down the street as well. It's affordable. There's not I a lot. Of, there's was not a lot. born and raised here. I know. I remember In this that. studio. In – well, wait a minute. In this studio? In this studio. <laughs> That's amazing. My mother was driven here in 1976, back when this was a milk farm in the middle of North Hollywood. Before this became the capital of pornography, it was just a place where cows roamed. Are you being serious? No. Okay. <laughs> there was there was a slight hint of like because I don't know no, you, dude. I got I was born at Kaiser. Come on. Look. Okay. So this is this is why I'm a Jew. <laughs> my, my mother would not have been like, hey, take me to the cow farm. I want to have I want to have I want to bring my son into the world naturally um, around all the cow patties and milk. You see, cow patty means poop. He's he's talking to my uh, producer right now. Michael's just nodding. Michael, Michael, you're such a man of a uh, few words, and and I don't know why I, I like that. But he has beautiful eyes. He does. They're sincere. 
No, this is why I wanted you on the podcast. What? Though. All the all the just non sequitur tangents? No, oh. because I don't know you that well. <laughs> is that is that, is that the prerequisite of having people on your show? No, but <laughs> I wasn't finished. Uh, sorry. I, I, no, I don't know you that well, but when I, when I went on your show. Yeah, that was a trip. I had a blast. Yeah, you blew me away. You came in with all this, like, deep knowledge. I just was wanting to talk about television. We got all philosophical and shit. Yeah, it was great. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I cuss on this show? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, like, I don't know how, you that how well. Clo- how close should I put the mic? You know how to, you know how close. I'm sir. never on this. I'm never at this seat. Oh, you're on this side, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. How how are you on? I don't like that seat. Yeah, it's weird. I like to be able to check in with Michael in case there's a fire. Michael can do with this, the fire. I'm so I'm so happy people are listening to uh, our, us figuring out logistics of microphones. <laughs> Sorry, it's Saturday. I, I know your uh, the episode goes up on Thursday, but we're recording this on Saturday. Sorry, no. man behind the curtain breaking down the fourth <laughs> wall. Now people know by this point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do I. I totally listen to your show every week. No, you don't. You do not. And that's okay, because I don't listen to yours every week either. I watch your YouTube clips. They're fun. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> Why I put on my Hawaiian shirt to be festive today. Um, no, but I didn't. I had such a good time with you, and I just clicked, and I was like, oh, he'd be good to have on the podcast, because you just seem like an interesting guy, and you've lived some I life. I seem like it. You seem like it. It's all acting. You have a lot of, like, sarcastic humor, which I like. And like the self-deprecating humor. Thanks. And like I feel like as we're getting through this conversation, like we'll bust each other's balls a little bit more, which I love doing with people. There's a guitar pick on the table. There is. I, sir. Is, is there a point in the show where I just, just you know, go Aaron Pruner unplugged? <laughs> just... is there a gu- oh, there's a guitar in here. Oh. There is the, that's. I think that's from Brett. Does it say Brett Davern show? Probably there? is. Yeah, I remember when he learned how to play the guitar for some movie. You can't stand that guy. Yeah. Whatever. Brett Davern. What a dick. <sighs> You know, our sh- my show's numbers with his, are so much with better his than his. blonde hair. <laughs> I keep with his blonde numbers. hair, looking like he just graduated high school. Whatever. So you have a kid coming. <laughs> yes, I do, dude. It's a weird world I'm living in right now. And you're married, right? Y- yes, right. yes, yes, I am. And you told me you didn't get much sleep last night because you're a light sleeper. Oh, we're gonna. <laughs> That's correct. That's why I have this coffee next to me. You're. I'm a light sleeper as well. And it sucks. And you know. A couple days ago, a news article went up online. This happens every so often in L.A. when we have an earthquake. Suddenly it's like, what to do when the big one happens? What to prepare for in Los Angeles when the big one happens? And, uh, yeah, I was here. I I was born and raised here. So I was here when the 94 earthquake happened in Northridge, where, like, I literally was thrown out of bed at, like, 430 in the morning. And I was dreaming that World War III was happening. Well, Well, here we are now where, like, things are happening in the world there was a big earthquake. I'm talking to my best friend in Hawaii yesterday, and he's like, I don't want to come back there. If I come back to L.A., the big one's going to happen. Mm. And put the anxiety of earthquakes back in my head. And I used to have this problem where before I would go to bed at night, yeah. I would think, what What do I do if an earthquake happens in the middle of the night? Well, now not only do I have myself to worry about, I got my wife to worry about. Now last night it was hard for me to fall asleep because I'm thinking, what will I do now that I'm going to have a daughter – Within the next, like, five months, Ugh. if a big earthquake happens in this crappy-ass building I'm living in, you know, like, yeah. like there's protocols to put in place, and uh, I have canned food and water and an emergency kit. You and have all a gun? This. I do not have a gun. Because uh, if you don't have a gun and things go really haywire, you're just collecting supplies for the next guy. <laughs> I just got so dark on you. Jesus <laughs> Christ. I watch enough uh, uh, dystopian <laughs> survivalist content, but uh, no, but I'm totally down to get a machete. Yeah, at least something. You need something. I don't have, no, but thank you, because that's now added to my the, 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 the list, the rundown yeah. every night, so I'm never going to sleep again. I, Thanks. I sleep It's with like Freddy Krueger, but not. I sleep with a giant knife next to my bed. My wife would not be okay with that. On your side? Just doesn't fucking matter, Why? dude. Why? Just to be safe. No? Uh, uh, it makes me feel comfortable. Yeah, I bet. Like just this giant blade. I could see you sitting there drinking your matcha tea, sharpening whatever machete, yeah. and just going to sleep with this, like this peaceful zen about you. But there's no sugar plum fairies in your head. It's just nothing but like massacring 
bad guys breaking in and uh, you know because here's the thing just 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 post-apocalyptic slaughter like a quiet place (laughs) but with all the sound it's 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 less slaughter it's more just just being surrounded with my protective devices Mm. i don't know i i sleep with my phone next to me and the white noise app is so soothing do you really have a nice white noise? I app? guess I do. I used to have that on mine. Mine used to be rain. Oh, mine is brown noise, and that really sounds brown... bad. Wait, but it's not. Wait, you got to play it on the show. What oh, brown it's noise? it just sounds like a it sounds like a fan. You know, when I grew up, it's I learned brown noise. Yeah, there's white noise, blue noise, and brown noise. But Mr. Michael, this, this can is we look, just. I mean, we... this is look. Re- the reason. Just sounds like. Oh, that's so interesting, dude. I could not. That sounds like static to me. Yeah. Wow. That would drive so me I'm, insane. I'm a, I'm a robot. Oh. I you didn't it. know that. Well. You heard about Westworld. From your logo, it's kind of hinting at it. A little bit. Dead air. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you want from me, man. See? Smooth brown noise. That just that, that sounds like the, the most perfect poop. So why is it called brown noise <laughs> don't know. versus white noise, Michael? There's different colors, and I think it's because of the, there's different tones. Different tones for the white noise. Let's see. It's because of the, it's named after Robert Brown, the discoverer of Brownian motion. Whoa, that is a, a so happy I could fact. Uh, so happy I could uh, <laughs> enrich your lives with uh, with my brown noise tidbit. Okay, so how long how long along is your wife right now? When did she give birth? Uh, our due date, our, our estimated due date is uh, September fourteenth. Okay, so you got a little bit of ways to go. A little bit. Hopefully, I'll find a permanent job by then. Right. And does your wife work? She she works a handful of jobs just like me. Gotcha. You nice. know the L A lifestyle. Is she, is she an act, like an artist as well? She's an audiobook narrator, voiceover artist. Uh, she oh, awesome. works teaching uh, toddlers how to dance. Great. She works for a, a, a wedding um, coordin- like an event planner, wedding yeah. company, and as a personal assistant. That's awesome. That's got to be pretty intense knowing that there's a mini you coming out at the end of the year. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, seriously. No, I mean, me, look, it's like... look, look, I showed you pictures of what I used to look like. There was a time where I never I never thought I was going to get married, let alone um, bring a kid into this world because my stance, and it's still hard to not think this way sometimes, is that this, the, the world is a garbage fire. Like Billy Corgan once said, the world is a trash fire. Um See, uh, why would I want to? Um, why would I want to bring uh, another person into this, this, this heaping, you know, <clears throat> maelstrom of chaos? Right. But now that it's happening, it's like there's a flip side of that where you know you have this, this, um, this growing level of empathy and hope. And I mean, I didn't have a dad growing up at all, so oh, it's also gotcha. it's also weird for me. Like I'd never been around kids. When I was on VR Troopers, the, yeah. the TV show I was on straight out of high school, my experience with children on that was not good. Like right, kids right. attacked me in public because my character was a living cartoon. Right, right. So they didn't treat me as Aaron Pruner, the person. They treated me as Percy, the character I played. So it was like I always kind of had that yeah. in the back of my head, and I didn't really have any experience with babies or anything. And, you know, there was a long time I was really depressed and sarcastic and hateful. Yeah. So, like, you know, I hated parents who brought their kids to restaurants and the kids would cry or on airplanes or shit like that. And you still see people reacting like that. But now that this this parenthood thing is looming, I'm starting to see things in a different light. I'm starting to realize how negative I used to be that I can still that I still am in, like, humorous ways. But, you know, I'm. I'm gonna have a little girl. Like I, I don't want to be what my dad was to me. So right, right. it's this weird thing that's happening where like I'm starting to see things differently, I'm starting to think about things differently, how I react to things differently mm. because it's not just gonna be about me anymore. Right. You know, so it's it's weird. It's like I don't want to be raising a kid in L.A., especially in the building I'm in. But like, it's all I'm all working towards trying to get to a place you know 
I think, and of course, this is coming from somebody who doesn't have a kid, but I know that you know of that I know of. Um, I know for a fact that your parental um, environment plays a large portion in how you're developing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, w- whether or not it's in a good. Um, like a higher income or a lower income type of home. Do you know what I mean? If the parental environment is good, then it kind of makes up for a lot of that other stuff. Um, and that's pretty cool that you're even aware of that. I have to be. I mean, so to try to not to get too far into it, um, in 1973, three years before I was born, my grandmother was in a car accident that killed my grandfather. Wow. Uh, a palm tree fell on the car. Whoa. On Sherman Way near near uh, Sepulveda, you know, roughly around that area. You know where the palm trees are lying in the streets? Yeah. One of the palm trees had dead roots. And apparently the person that the tree uh, was on his property, like he had been told time and again to remove the tree and he never did. It was a really windy day like like a couple of days ago. Yeah. Tree fell over, landed on their car, killed my grandfather. The crux of the whole thing was he was driving her to a surprise birthday party. So it happened on her birthday. And this was three years before I was born. So this sort of fractured my family, and my mother met my dad and got married. It turned out my dad was an alcoholic, yeah. you know, deadbeat. They were together until I was one, and my mom got kind of sick and tired of bailing him out of jail when he would, you know, drive drunk and stuff. So, like, I grew up with my grandmother and mom as my parents, and my grandmother never really got over the accident because mm-hmm. my mom, you know, she had her own shock and stuff that she was dealing with with the grief so there was a lot of chaos growing up between you know those two as my parental figures i didn't have a father figure at all there was no male and when a man tried to come into play like i was you know i puffed my chest and threw my brown noise at him Uh, you know like (laughs) so it was just it's it was um I relate a lot to old people because I grew up around old people. Yeah. And it it shaped who I was. I was bullied all the time when I was a kid because I had no strong um, male figure in my life. And my mom, because of her experience with my dad and that accident, she became very reserved and taught me to run from confrontation Mm. because she didn't want me to go down the road my dad went down, which only then – pushed me the opposite direction and that's why I started getting depressed and led to like suicidal stuff throughout my high school years and stuff like that, that I then was able to work out in in not just therapy, but like I became a goth kid. Yeah. I I went to goth clubs for like 10 years and I, I met people that I finally related to because I didn't relate to many people in high school. I, I mean, I got into theater. That's one of the places where I like met a bunch of other weirdos who were like me, but but yeah, here I am now, and it's like I look at all the stuff that I've been through and like what caused what to happen, and my frame of reference. And my dad died like ten years ago. I never really knew him, but I found this out. Like he apparently never graduated high school, and went to jail for meth uh, manufacturing and dealing. Jesus. So like that's my lineage, and I didn't really like when he died. I'm like you know I I, I was brought up to hate him. Uh, but then once he passed away, I, this, 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 this show got deep. Uh, once he yeah. passed away, it was like, there are answers I'm never going to have, you know, right. when I got like, so I had this kid coming and we cool. went and had a, a meeting with a doctor and they're asking like for family history. Right. I don't know. You know, sorry, I was trying to find, I didn't know if you were gonna keep going. I was going to make a note. You said something, there are answers you'll never have. And that's something that's, you know, bugged me in my personal life, uh, for certain things that have happened or just things I want to know. And then I think to myself, what if I did have those answers? How would that change how I'm going to keep moving forward? If cancer runs in the father's side of my family, that's, that's, that's helpful information to know, you know, stuff like that. Okay. I'm not, I'm not Um, talking about like, it would be nice to know. Like I found out when I was a kid that my dad had a previous marriage, and I have a half brother and half sister out gotcha. there. Gotcha, that kind of stuff. I and, and and my mom invited them over for dinner, and they look like my my dad's blonde, blue eyes. I don't look like my mom said I only look like him when I get angry, which 
cool. But she invited these two people over to the house. And at the time, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? I don't want to know these people. You yeah. brought me up to hate my dad. And now you're inviting their kids over who look like him. Like, yeah. I don't want to have that connection. But that was when I was a lot younger. You grow up, you become a man or woman, whatever. You become an adult and you start trying. Like, I started having empathy for the guy instead of hating the guy. And yeah. When I I used to work at MySpace, and when I was at MySpace, this was back in like 20, uh, 2006, 2007, um, my dad never paid child support, right? And they apparently found him. The, 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 the lawyer that was originally hired became a cold case in the 80s, and they never got the money. Well, they opened up the cold case, offered my mom uh, back pay. Apparently, my dad owed something like $180,000 in child support. And I found out that way that my dad was destitute and he was making about $1,200 a month. And we were garnishing his wages without talking to him, which was like $600 a month. And he couldn't afford to live. He was like crashing on a friend's couch. And well, my mom is talking well, to me about this. And I said to her, I'm like, we've made it this far without him. Right. So like maybe... You, you maybe it would be helpful to get to a point where you forgive him for what he did and know that he needs money to live too. Mm. And she was all quiet looking at me crazy. I'm like, what you're gonna keep holding on to this for 40 years? Like, and my mom does hold on to things, but I'm like, there's a point where you have to stop just thinking about how it's affected you and think about what started in his life to make him behave like this that led him down this road. And so bringing it back around to being a father, yeah, it's like I've never really done anything horrible like that, but it really makes you reflect on your life, you know, and everything that has brought you up to this point. And now I'm, like, very aware. I say offensive things. I cuss a lot, and I'm going to have to, like, censor the fuck out of my words right. once this girl's wrong. I told my wife, I'm like, so basically I can't listen to hip hop in the car anymore because <laughs> I'm not going to listen to the edited stuff like this. <laughs> no, it's just going to be nothing but like Sesame Street and Doc McStuffins or whatever the hell kids are into right yeah. now. I, I I don't know your parenting side. First of all, I just want to say real quick, um, it's, again, pretty cool that you're aware of all that stuff and despite your hard upbringing to say the least uh your difficult upbringing it's really cool that you're taking the i would think the right steps in making sure that your kid doesn't have to deal with all that because i know it might seem like the natural like yeah of course that's the good thing to do and it is um but i man i hear stories every day of like <laughs> people who just are just like ruining their children and it's like oh my god that kid is gonna have the toughest time growing up yeah there's shit there's this like, i mean i was bullied a lot but i feel like once again that become that that's part of how you're you know what what behaviors are taught you know yeah by your, by your parents yeah that's and i was true. just taught to run i was taught oh well, i had friends in high school or not high school what was it uh middle school um i was a year younger than i was supposed to be in school and then i already like look young and i'm kind of smaller than everybody else i was in martial arts and stuff but i kind of made friends with all like the the the, the these um uh, what's what's the best way to put this um so my bus route went through a very low income neighborhoods oh so you came through my hood yeah <laughs> uh, i lived next to a crack house growing up oh really yeah okay so in tulsa like it's just it's just really funny how like uh, it's kind of like L.A. In, in certain, not every part, but like very few select parts. Be a fine neighborhood. It's like okay, you know what I mean. And then a really low income neighborhood. Yeah. And it, that's just the bus route. And I became friends with all like the kids that rode the bus route with me. So one day in middle school, I'm, I had collected Pokemon cards. And uh, <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm a lot older than you. Yeah. And so <laughs> Pokemon. I collected Tiddlywinks. What is that? Uh, look it up. Tiddlywinks. <laughs> Actually, I more so collected Garbage Pail Kids, but Tiddly Winks Oh, I know Garbage Pail Kids, yeah. So anyway, this kid was, like, um, picking on me, and then he, uh, what, what is, it? oh, oh, okay. Oh, did you collect Pogs? I guess that's what they, that's what they were originally. Holy shit, Tiddly Winks were the early Pogs. Whoa. 
That just blew my mind. The future. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, I got bullied, but I had friends who made sure I wasn't bullied. So that was cool. But I learned at an early age to get out of being bullied. Um, I had to be funny. So that's where this uh, self-deprecating humor came from. Because if you can make the bully laugh, and it's usually by making fun of yourself before they do. Yeah. I, I even ha- I, I had one person in particular. I forget what the guy's name was, but he was like this big asshole at school. And he was like, oh, you're funny. And I'm all, well, I figured I'd insult myself before you had a chance to do it because at least I would have better punchlines. Yeah. You know, and then it just kind of went, you know, I mean, Jews, right? Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. <sighs> That's That just still blows my mind, dude. I can't imagine, like, I'm, I'm assuming you have a good relationship with your wife and just – I know I'm, I keep going back to this kid thing. <laughs> you but... can assume all you want. <laughs> She's not listening to She's this not show. Listening. No, um, no, I just think that's really cool. And that's probably, I don't know. I don't know. It just really makes my mind think about having a little person around that's half me and half it's weird. Else. She's growing a human inside of her. It's very alien like to me. Yes. That's the part I'm like yes. trying to hit. Yes. Like. And when, like, go on YouTube and look up. I don't even know what you would look up, but I've seen videos of really pregnant women where it looks like you you're about to have an alien burst out of your chest where you like their stomachs all moving around because you see the handprint inside creeps me the fuck out. Yeah. And then when she comes and she wants to hug me and cuddle with me, I'm like, I don't know where to touch you because you have an alien inside of your body. Yeah, it's so weird. Have you felt a kick yet? Or is it no, I, I, I have not. Yeah. Is it um, at that stage? She, there's like fluttering, Fl- fluttering. Yeah, because it's a little, it's a little bean. Oh, you know, oh, like, you oh know. it's still that early. That's right, September. What are we in? Like April? Yeah. March? Yeah, you got a while, dude. When you see, you the say I got a while. It's gonna go by really fast. Yeah. How's so? A little bit about your podcast. A little bit about it. It's like open, kind of like mine. O- open format. We have got an hour to it's talk. It's not on an that. open format. No. It's not. No. My show is about television. Oh. So I open with TV news and trending topics about television. I try to open up to, you know, have conversation with our listeners. I don't know who's listening because no one ever tweets me. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, talk about what's going on in television. Second segment, I bring in uh, a guest yeah. that is involved with television, TV, someone yeah, yeah. who might, you know, be on a Shonda Rhimes show. Who knows? Holy shit. Then my episode, I went off the rails. That, that must have been super weird. It's fine. Oh, gosh. It's fine. Yeah. I like it when when things go unexpectedly. Yeah, because then I learn something, and then usually the third segment. Um, I think you stayed for two segments because sometimes I do that. Yes. Or the th- yeah. So say. the third segment, we kind of I I, I uh, highlight shows that may have just premiered that I'm really into. Uh, last week's episode, I sort of went down this this direction of talking about how people get their news. Because my mother likes to ask me, did you watch the news last night? There was a shooting near my house. I'm like, no, I don't watch network news because it's depressing. And yeah. I get all my news on the Internet. It's quicker. And, I you know, then I was talking about on the show about alternative uh, news shows like what, what like like what Vice does or uh, United Shades of. America on CNN, you know, where where it's like a docu series where they tackle different issues. Like Katie Couric has a new show uh, where she's doing that for Nat Geo, where it's like taking the current events that are happening, but then turning it just a little bit to explore one big issue and all the facets of that. That's a that's a thing that happens a lot now. Or like John Oliver or Samantha B, like their type of stuff. But I went down this road about accountability. Because uh, early on in the episode, I was talking about how the parent-teacher council wants to <laughs> consult scientists before Netflix releases season two of 13 Reasons Why to make sure it's appropriate for children. And I basically said, fuck you, because season one of 13 Reasons Why is about a girl like in the book, it's about a girl who kills herself. Yeah. And the story plays out in a narrative where each episode is a different cassette tape that she makes 13 cassette tapes and you have to get a Walkman to listen to the tapes. So there's that gimmick, that retro stylized narrative gimmick of having this like dead technology that is now cool again telling you why she killed herself, which ends up being she blamed all these people instead of taking the blame herself and taking responsibility and accountability herself for committing a heinous act. And when I was 17, I tried to kill myself. Mm. And I'm watch- when I watched it, it was a really 
difficult thing to watch. But it also really pissed me off because the whole show was like, we have to show it to show you how bad it is. But I'm like, you're glamorizing it. You're making it this stylized thing. And you're presenting suicide as something that that is not a personal decision. That is something you could just blame other people for, which is not a good message. So I started off talking about that. And then I ended the show talking about different docuseries that are out there, including Rapture on Netflix. First episode is Logic, who is a rapper out there. And I wasn't too familiar with him. And he has that song about suicide. But it's about, like, I'm watching this episode. I'm like, this guy is just being vulnerable and and showing his emotion and something that you never see in this this music and culture of, of a guy being honest, brutally honest about this emotional experience he went through. And instead of promoting violence and hate, promoting love and respect – and also giving a voice to those many people out there who go through this on a daily basis. And, I mean, that's, I think, the right way to do it. It was really commendable. And so sometimes I get deep on my show, but it's always yeah. about, like, TV. I heard when that show came out, I heard a lot of people didn't like it because of that reason. <sighs> Man, you could have shown suicide in a way where it didn't actually show her taking a razor to her wrist in a bathtub. But it was just building it up as... This isn't my problem. This is your problem. Have you ever seen Dexter? Yeah, I've seen every episode. I was not a fan of the way that show ended. It kind of reminded oh. me of the same. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, yes, yes. The lumberjack ending was the, probably the worst way a TV show has ended in recent years. So, spoiler alert. So, wait, I'm so, talking suicide. No, Did you go to Dexter? Well, this is why. <laughs> I know it's, it's ridiculous, but no, because in Dexter, uh, it's just – Showing people who are holding people – it's it's supposed to be holding people accountable for doing, like, I think, like, a, like certain acts or, or horrible acts. Like, he was a serial killer, mm -hmm. you know? And at the end, it, everybody – like, his, the most important people in his life die. His sister dies. And that's his punishment. And – yeah, and then he just becomes a lumberjack and he lives gets away. In seclusion, yeah. Oh, uh, dude, that's not a that's not a <laughs> that's not no. a good message to send out there to people no, of who want to go be like vigilantes. But, but but the difference here is this was Can a I genre show. Ones? This How was this was a genre show. I mean, when you think about that, this was a show that was based on books. This this was based on a series of books that came out right. called Darkly Dreaming Dexter, where that that, that was already like this kind of like vigilante story where it was it was a horror tv show right you know you watch stuff like hannibal or whatever it kind of has that similar feel to it i'm not defending the way the show ended because that was a horrible ending but if you're comparing that to 13 reasons why 13 reasons why is based in quote unquote reality where you know teens deal with this on a daily basis yeah this girl was raped and all this stuff on this show and it was about tearing her character down to a point where she no longer wanted to live. When I, you know, I get that. It was just the way that the show presented that big event. Right. When they defended it as being that we had to show how how violent and visceral and unattractive. And I'm like, unattractive, though. Like, you're presenting the whole thing in a stylized manner with, with you know, it's it's all these pretty people. In like the CW style uh, world, yeah, and they're all rich and they're all like partying and stuff, and so high school life is different for them than say what my high school life was like growing up. And then you see a uh, dude riding his bike around with the, with the, the headphones on for his Walkman, listening to her talking. So there's that narrative component component that's a little different than normal TV shows. And then it gets to this heightened point where she makes all these tapes and assigns them out. You see that happen. Then she gets in the bathtub and does it. It's almost romanticized. And when I was watching this, the first thing that went through my head was if I was a kid watching this, I would take that challenge. I would be like, I could do that and survive. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Because it's almost like you had uh, – I guess there's this trend. And I, I don't know. I'm not – I can't speak for kids nowadays. But growing up, there was this trend for me where it was like you tell me I can't do it. You tell me this is this is something that's dangerous. Well, I'll prove you wrong. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I yeah, got yeah. into the goth industrial scene out here, and it was all like you, you watch like uh, the interview with the vampire or any horror film, like anything about vampires or like Dexter it was a lot of blood. And blood becomes romanticized after a while in, yeah. in certain scenes. And you see that, and it's like 
Yeah, it's horrific, but also there's there's a there's an angle to it where it could just be challenging a viewer to 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 t- to do that themselves. Uh, kind of circling on the subject of accountability, and since I myself have never experienced anything to an extreme level of wanting to commit suicide, do you think it's a is it a selfish act? You think of su- suicide for certain cases or all cases? All cases of suicide are selfish. Gotcha. Even if there's other layers to it, at the end of the day, you're taking your life in your own hands and you're ending it, Mm -hmm. you know, and I know like when I went through it, um, I just was really I had a lot. I was really unbalanced, emotionally speaking, in high school. I got beat up a lot. I got made fun of a lot. I didn't really have um, a social life. I, I wasn't popular with girls and you get you become at least for me, I became so introverted in that sense that I had violent outbursts at school. Right. Like you see people who go and do uh, mass shootings at schools. Like I watch that and I think I understand, at least kind of understand the mentality that they're in. You get to a point where you're pushed down so much that you hate everyone. Right. And you don't take you don't consider any value in any person's lives that you come across and they all become the enemy. Where, where did that start switching for you then? And ha- and and at what was there cert- something that just kind of started to click for you, like maybe in college or after high school or, or your early adult life? Because that's there's like a little chunk missing for me understanding, like because right now you seem a lot of fun to hang out with. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and like you seem cool and everything, and um, you know, you got a family coming, and it's that's cool. Then you describe your high school, and it's like, oh shit, yeah, no dad, rough, uh, alone, and uh, you know not with the girls, uh, you know, all that stuff. When I was three years old, my grandmother told me that my mom was never coming home when she was uh, on a trip. She was on a vacation trip to Hawaii. And I think that was it. I had this breakthrough in therapy when I was in therapy in 2000. You're looking at me with this horrifying look on your face. No, no, I'm I'm sorry. When you were, I'm talking about after your high school. Hold on. Oh, okay. So I had this epiphany when I was in therapy. I went into therapy in 2007 after getting out of a really bad relationship with a girl. And we connected it like I kept bouncing around from bad relationship to bad relationship. And there was a time where I was like, well, I just I'm into crazy girls, crazy in the head, crazy in the bed. (laughs) But then it gets to a point where you're like, you can't keep blaming others. Maybe there's something about me that I'm in this pattern. Why am I doing this? And when I was in therapy, I realized I had a separation anxiety that was developed at a really young age. So when my grandmother was in that accident, my mother never visited her in the hospital for six months because she could not deal with the grief. And she was in her own shock and did not get the help she needed. And so as long as I as long as my grandmother was alive, she held that over my mother's head and me. And at a very young age, I only remembered this in therapy that she came up to me. I was three and she was like, your mother's never coming home. Jeez. And that planted a seed in me. To always be afraid that my mother was going to forget about me picking me up at school, drop me off somewhere, and just leave me there. And growing up, that turned into resentment, and I started hating my mother. And we we started having a really bad relationship, and I disconnected from her in my high school years. And by that point, we had moved out of my grandmother's apartment. It was just myself and my mom. And, you know, there was kind of like this mama mama's boy thing because the more I disconnected from her – because of that, the more she would try to contact me. She'd page me all the time because back then we had pagers, not cell phones. And uh, when I went out to clubs in my early 20s, she'd call me like five, six times a day. Like it would get to that point. And I then I found that I redirected that attention to girls that treated me like shit. But in between that, I didn't know how to connect with people. Because I didn't know who to trust, and I was always taught to run from confrontation. So I sort of, you know, went inward because no one really understood me. And it, it ended up manifesting itself in, like, I hung out with the wrong people. Mm. Uh, I was bullied a lot by the quote-unquote friends I had. I was taken advantage of a lot because, you know, I just wanted to have friends. And, like, it, it ended up – some things ended up uh, spilling back on my mother. And the, so it got to a point where it was like – I can't connect with my mom. I can't connect with the people that I want to be friends with. I discovered theater, which was like my only outlet aside from all the poetry I was writing. But I mean, if it wasn't for theater and poetry and and all the writing I was doing, like, I don't know, man, like that's what I connected it all to. Just just not having a a strong support 
a strong level of support or community to to really build me up because when I started going to goth clubs and it's just really silly to say goth clubs saved me but like I got into acting VR troopers the commercials I did they sort of acted as therapy for me in a way that I was able to get all this negative energy out in in like a sense of comedy so to speak you know what I mean like you look at Robin Williams people like how could he kill himself well there's a fine line between pain and comedy you know, most people who are making a living, making people laugh, they're drawing from some sort of demons and pain inside of them to make that work. I, there was a documentary on on HBO about Gary Shandling and about his journey as a comedian uh, through like meditation and living life as a Buddhist, trying to find that ultimate truth and why he's driven to make people laugh. There's a fine line. And. If you don't find the balance between those two places, you know, you could easily go to a very dark place. And I went to a very dark place. Yeah. I mean, I never did it, but I was there with a knife on my wrist. You know, it was like. But then I had that thought of like, how is this going to affect other people? How is this going to affect my mother, my family? She's already dealt with a lot of loss. Like, I wasn't just thinking about me. I was thinking about the implications mm-hmm. that that would have. You know what? That's uh, that's a pretty trippy feeling. Yes. The one with your the knife on your wrist. So I was shooting something uh, a couple of weeks ago on a rooftop downtown, and uh, I was on the edge of the building, and I wasn't planning. Uh, I didn't have any kind of like suicidal. You're like, like fuck tendencies. you, Hollywood. <laughs> right. Uh, no, but I kind of looked over and I was like, holy shit! If I literally just take one step more, that it's it's done. Yeah, you know it's done, and and then I started thinking of the implications of everything, and I started getting this like weird—I don't want to call it an adrenaline rush. Maybe it was like some adrenaline was released in my system, but I didn't want to do it. But it it got me really scared, and like the negative, all like the negative chain reaction that would cause it just like plus it really there was scared me. There was another point of it where I was like, I was too afraid to do it. Mm. Just for the simple fact that I don't like pain. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't oh, want to cut not, myself. Not because of any kind of higher power punishing you or oh, you no. believe any of that At stuff? At that time, I did not. I mean, now I don't know what I believe. Like, right. I feel like there is – we'd be – I feel like I don't necessarily subscribe to any religion. My in-laws are all really Christian, wanted to convert me when uh, I proposed to my wife. I don't believe in organized religion, but I can't close myself off to the possibility of something being out there because I don't have the proof. You know, I don't. That's why I guess that's what faith is called. But like, I don't have the answers. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. But at that time, when I was 17, I was like, fuck the establishment. You know, I was the kid wearing all black reading like Friedrich Nietzsche and watching David Lynch movies in high school. Like I was the one blasting nine inch nails downward spiral in my car on the lunch on my lunch break and like reading Franz Kafka and you know Clive Barker and all this stuff like there wasn't yeah. and I went to a small school there wasn't a lot of people that that I could relate to on that yeah. level I wish I wish growing up and I got a little bit of this from my parents my parents were very supportive they told me go learn all, about all religions and they were very like go go study learn ask questions and what I wish there was more in organized religion, especially living in Oklahoma growing up. Um, they would tell you like, hey, don't lie. Don't steal. These are the rules. Okay, but why? Yes, I know it kind of – yeah, you shouldn't steal. You go to jail. But no, why shouldn't you steal from people? Why shouldn't you lie? What are the harmful effects that could cause? I wish uh, there was you more You can end up religion. living forever as a lumberjack in the woods after your sister dies. <laughs> it doesn't kill her. <laughs> no, he does. Well, Yes. He kind kills of, her, right? He, no, she died in the hospital, and he then he ends up throwing her uh, – like she was in a coma or something, and then he took her from the hospital, and she died in his boat. So he tossed her off the boat into the part of the, the ocean where he would toss, toss his dead bodies. During a hurricane. During a hurricane, yes. And he rode the boat into the hurricane. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys, people get pissed off at the way Lost ended, but I mean, at least that followed through on the mythology that's, that yeah, show created. That's a, that's a hard sell. I stopped watching Lost, I think, after 
second season or third and midway through the third season because my roommates at the time were like, this is a great show. You're going to have so many questions and it's like really mysterious. I'm like, cool. I had more questions than I had questions answered around like mid third season. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I can't afford to invest in this show anymore. Yeah. What is it? Like seven seasons? Six, I think. Six? Yeah. Yeah. I got to They answered a lot of the questions, but they had more questions. (laughs) Like, at the end, it was like, were they in purgatory and, like, all this shit? I, I did not believe that they were in purgatory, but a lot of my friends were like, that's a waste of time, and you're shaking your head. I say they weren't. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I agree. They explained it. In yeah, the, in, I know. In the I know, but I think also the problem was the show ended. The show, the show changed everything, by the way. The first official podcast about television came out because of Lost. Lost was the first show that did any of that, that appealed to... The internet sensibilities of the, you could have a TV show online that then has Easter eggs and con, uh, supplemental content on the internet that could appeal to fans, a growing fan base, to really tie it into a campaign such as that. So in between lost seasons, they did web series online. They did an ARG game. That was the first show. That's alternate reality, by the way. Gotcha. Um, they that was the first official podcast. They came out in like 2005 or 2006. So like they changed everything, but. I feel like it was ahead of its time for TV audiences, where you see shows like this all the time now. Back then, people were like, wait, I have to invest time to really figure this out? So something that I have a question for in season one is not going to be answered until season five? You see that all the time now. The Walking Dead does it. Like, um, uh, Game of Thrones does it. But at the time, audiences were not familiar with this type of Storytelling on television. I love, by the way, how we turned it back to TV. Oh, did we? We went from talking about suicide and religion um, to TV because this is We Sam's world. We're just living in it. That's that's the motto from now on. <laughs> um, have you ever heard of the book Extreme Ownership? No. It's by Jocko Willink, and yeah, I mentioned it again. I think I've mentioned this book every single time. This um, episode of We Sam's World brought to you by. Extreme ownership. Uh, no, it it's a book that's really one of those books that really change your life and change the way you approach uh, your career, your relationships. Is this uh, like one of those self help life coaching things? I don't even want to call it self help. That has a stigma calling it something self help because you know why people always go, "Oh, here we go. It's just going to be about positivity," and it's it's not. It's not just that. I used it's, to have a negative perspective on self-help books. I used to work in a bookstore where I had to shelve books in the self-help area yeah. all the time. But my wife is very much into self-improvement and constantly learning uh, different habitual ways to train your brain, change behaviors for the better, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I like self-control better. Sorry. Self-control. That sounds better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I've more so learned that uh, self-help has this negative stigma, but it's really about I, – I, I've been thinking a lot about the importance of words, especially where uh, my wife and I have been talking about ways we communicate and the, implica- the implication of specific words and what that means subconsciously mm. to you. Uh, maybe self-betterment. I'm just saying self-help sounds like you're giving yourself up as kind of like a victim to be able to admit you need yeah. help. You know what I mean? Where it's it shouldn't be it should be self-improvement or whatever you self-control whatever. Yeah. Because when I was a lot younger, I never thought I needed that. I never thought that uh well, I'm fine. I you know, I went to a therapist and he said, "You don't need Xanax. You have you've gotten to this age and you haven't tried killing yourself yet." And I'm like, "Well, sir, <laughs> but <laughs> Um, but you know, that's where it ended well, when you, <laughs> and you just leave. I was like, yeah, here's your money and then walk out. But like, if you flip it and substitute one word for another, that means exactly the same. It has a different, like, instead of saying pain, say discomfort that has a different connotation in your brain, you know? So yeah. now I have a different perspective on self-help books and it might be because my wife reads a ton of them. But also I've seen the progression and a change in her over the time that I, I – when I first met her to now to being able to control certain negative emotions better and to really think about yeah. why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling before I just react. You should definitely check out the book. Um, 
because you're all about ownership, it seems like. I am? Yeah. Okay. It seems like that. I just, uh, I'm about renting. That's all the time we got for today. <laughs> I'll be here all week. <laughs> just uh, just look under the desk. I don't um, know. No, and he has another book called Discipline Equals Freedom. I highly recommend them to you. If you, if you want to read, the Discipline Equals Freedom. I never want to Spo- read. It's on Spotify. So if you just want to hear uh, this guy read it to you, it's um, it's changed my life for the better. And every time I give it to somebody, it seems to change my life. Have you read it yet, Michael? Not yet. I'm still trying to get through Game of Thrones. <sighs> oh, fuck Game of Thrones. Damn it, Michael. I'm not a Game of Thrones fan, by the way. That's fine. So, is it? Is it okay? Is this a safe space? <laughs> you said that very defensively, so I had to make There have feel... been times where people are like, well, it's like, it's like, it's like imagine saying to someone, uh, Star Wars? Yeah. You know, like, there's there are certain things that have found their place in the pop culture ethos in our country or the world where it's like, if you say you're not into it, like, I was watching, and mind you, I don't watch this show regularly, but I was watching Bill Maher a couple weeks, maybe it was a month ago, and he was like, I haven't seen Black Panther yet. And when people, when I tell people that, they're like, freak out, because how could you not go see it? Yeah. Where it's like, so when I say, I, eh, Game of Thrones, whatever. I'm busy. That's what I, I mean, say. I'm busy. I don't. I am I busy, usually watching TV for work, but I've seen and I've seen every episode of Game of Thrones. But it's like, eh. it's it's so hard. I'm sorry, Mike. I can't imagine watching that show weekly. I have to binge watch it. It's one of those shows where it's like, I need I need to know what's happening. I need to finish this. Like Breaking Bad, oh. I enjoyed Breaking Bad. The first, what is it? It's six seasons too, right? Or five seasons? It was five. They cut the fifth season into two halves. Okay. So uh, I basically binged watched all up until the fifth season. And then having to watch the second half of the fifth season weekly gave me anxiety. Because I was like, I need this show to be done because I'm thinking about it during the week. I need, I need to finish it and I need to move on with my life. Imagine having a job. Where one of your sole responsibilities is to watch an episode, I can't do that. take notes while the episode is happening, and then break the episode down in an article in a way where you start a conversation with a viewer or reader in a manner in which maybe they didn't think of something that popped in your head about that episode. That's not my thing, man. Yeah. I'm an actor. Yeah. Okay. Hey. It's not my thing. I guess at the heart, at, at its heart, I'm an actor too. But it's something that I did, uh, still do for. Like right now, I'm covering The Walking Dead for Rotten Tomatoes, which means every Sunday I have to sit and watch The Walking Dead and take notes, and then um, write basically the five biggest moments and tie it back to like a social media component with how Twitter reacted. But not just give you a recap, tell you why it's important this thing happened and what that may mean as an implication down the line. But this is The Walking – yeah, but it's The Walking Dead, and The Walking Dead is not the best show anymore. So it's like it's still work, See, and it makes watching TV a whole lot less uh, enjoyable. That is that is that journalism, or would you be considered a writer, or maybe both? It's what journalism looks like now in the entertainment space. In the entertainment space. Okay. Because I am not a writer. I'm not a journalist, so I wanted to know the difference. I never went to school for this. I just started doing it as a hobby, and it turned into a thing. And you were Roughly good around it. the time that acting stopped coming my way. Yeah. Was that because of uh, the way you started changing? Because I know, like, recently, within the last, what, two, three years, I've become into a new, like, age bracket, if you will. Yeah, so, I'm now in the dad age bracket, which yeah. was weird until my wife got pregnant. But, like... um, yeah, you know, back in 2008, a lot happened. So I used to look a lot different. I was 40 pounds lighter. I had dyed black hair. I had no beard. I was really pale. And I got a lot of, like, these nerdy, quirky roles, which which served me well, except I did not manage my money at all or anything like that. I was like, ah, I'm rich, and just, yeah. you know. But roughly around 2008, my agent that got me all that work died of cancer. The economy tanked. <laughs> And I stopped getting work. And it was around that time where I was like, fuck, I need to figure, like, what else am I going to do with my life? Right. And in 2009, I just started as a hobby blogging about horror films. And that sort of opened up a different world for me. And I met all these people. And I used that to, like, write for another place that started paying me, although yeah. it wasn't the best place to work. But, like, just sort of 
I guess, snowballed from there. Like I was talking to my wife, Kelly, about this the other day where she met me when I wasn't doing this for a living. I was working at MTV and like tech support, you know, while I was still while I was still Wait, auditioning for commercials. Tech support for what? In 2008, I got a job. <laughs> you gave me the biggest sigh. <laughs> in 2007, 2008, I got a job at a internet startup called Social Project, where I was one of the customer service content moderating tech support people, and MTV was our main investor. MTV ended up coming in in 2008, roughly, uh, I think it was a couple months after Bear Stearns and the economy tanked and everything. MTV came in and bought the company. Okay. Laid everyone off except the customer service department, tech support, member support, and moved us into the MTV building and sat me down and the rest of us down next to casting on the first floor of the MTV building. So I sat next to the guy that cast you on Awkward. Oh. Danny. Whoa. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> that guy was not nice to me at all. Really? But, like, it, our, our department did not fit in because everyone on that floor was all casting <laughs> and story <laughs> development. Oh, and then our department was, like, we looked like we didn't belong in the building. And no one knew what we did. And most of our job was content moderation. So sometimes you would see porn on our screen because members would upload stuff that they would try to get onto their social network or whatever that wouldn't uh, comply with our terms of service. And then you had actors coming in to audition. And it's like it was just really weird. Like every time Brett uh, and Bo would come in, they would see me and they would just come and hang out at my desk and would piss Danny off so much. Like, yeah, dude. This business is the weirdest business in the world. There and this was after I like met it. my wife. So I, I met my wife, and I met them through her because uh, my wife was friends with uh, Brett and his wife back when they first moved out oh, here. Oh, okay. Now I know kind of your 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 connection with Brett then. Okay. Yeah. That makes This is making more sense. The Adobe family, the Brett, the nice guy digital family, how it's all coming together. Okay. Wait, there was something else we were talking about before. I don't know I what we were talking interrupted about. you. Yeah, I don't know. We've branched out. On... Sorry. I mean, I'm not really. Don't be sorry. <laughs> I not. love it. We've branched out on He's so just many... shrugging. <laughs> Michael's the most laid back and the, probably the coolest dude in here. Uh, you know what? Yeah, you're probably the coolest guy in here right now. Michael just shrugs. Um, so how long have you been with Nice Guy Digital? Like doing the podcast here? Since February. Okay. So not years. No. Oh, okay. Are you kidding me? I thought no. it was years. No. Um, I did a podcast called Pass the F in Remote uh, at Geek Nation. Okay. So you had podcasts. That was something I started in 2012 with my co-host, Jack Conway, who is still my co-host on Punch Drunk TV because the show became Punch Drunk TV after uh, falling out with Geek Nation. But we we had a, kind of a similar studio setup that we have here, and I would bring in talent mm-hmm. every week. And one week I brought Brett in. Yeah. And he was he acted as my quote unquote co host as Jack was out of town and he really enjoyed it. And he told me he was like, You're you're my inspiration to do my own pot like he told me being on my show was an inspiration to him to start the Brett Davern show. What? That's right. He said that? He said that to me. Oh, he said that to you? Uh-huh. Huh. That's really interesting. Oh. Huh. Why? Because he he said that to me too. Really? <laughs> huh. Okay. Oh. Oh, is oh, that this is true? The, this is the huh. fucking teaser for the oh, show. Brett? Brett, what what are you, you know, doing, man? You know, this is called nice guy digital, but that is not a very nice guy thing to do, Brett Davern. Uh-uh. That's... When did you start your show, We Sam? Uh, this one? No, the one that inspired him to start his. Uh, 2014. Ah, I'm first! <laughs> Shit. 2012. I had him on... I think I had him on in 2000. No, I had him on early. It was either 2012 or 2013. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to start my own uh, podcast network. network? Yeah. You want to bring you? you yeah. You join? I'm free. Yeah. I'm available. I think we should ask God. I don't Fish really Game. have a full time job or anything. <laughs> I already have my own poster. Uh, you know, they're changing the Brett Davern show, the, the Katie, uh, Katie LeClerc show. Uh, it's Katie LeClaire. I What did I say? LeClerc. She yeah, she's it. she's corrected me, and I don't want to get on her bad side. Yeah, the Katie LeClaire <laughs> show. Oh my god! Call it the LeClaire Rapport. 
Oh, that's actually sounds that sounds good. I like yeah. that. She'd be good at news. No. Maybe she she would be, but it's I don't a play on good. the Colbert Report, by the way. Thank you, Mike, for getting it. I got it. I just didn't. <laughs> Fucking Brett. <laughs> God damn it. Um, now I'm sad. Uh, I'm... Just blame it on me. I have a great knack of making people sad. And laugh at the same time. <laughs> Only on Pruner TV will you feel this layered sense of disappointment and hilarity all rode up into one hour of television talk guys we're on the one hour mark uh and we're with the emotionally stable <laughs> aaron Pruder. i'm a stable genius <laughs> do you have any free time nowadays then uh <laughs> i like how you i like how you uh transition to that i that's a weird question to answer i so most of my what? work <laughs> what is that weird no because i'm trying to think about this there was a time where all I had was free time, and when I, I, I think about it, I do two podcasts. I'm in a copywriting class at night, so I'm trying to, at some point, make a portfolio to maybe pivot into copywriting and advertising because that feels more lucrative and pays more than editorial. But in the meantime, I'm freelancing for Rotten Tomatoes, I'm freelancing for Playboy, gotcha. I'm freelancing for Looper, I'm freelancing for GameSpot, and working as a freelance journalist, it's like half the work is fi finding the work. And then, yeah. then there's the whole research component of like for looper.com. I've been writing these like 2000 word articles that re require a lot of research. So it takes a lot longer. So when you ask if I have free time, uh, I do set time aside. Like I go, to, I try at least one day a week to not work and go to a movie or something. But yeah. I'm going to be leaving here and going home to watch screeners for work. For work. Yeah. And tomorrow, Sunday, I have to be at the television for work in the evening on a Sunday night. And, you know, I have it mapped out on my calendar when yeah. different articles are due. But it's like I, I, almost exactly a year ago, I got laid off from my full-time job that was also doing this. And it's just like a compare now to the money that I make now doing this as opposed to what I was making when I was at zap to it. And I had benefits and it was a guaranteed paycheck. And now I'm just like constantly working and hustling to try to at least make half of that mm. while I'm in class and looking for the next thing. So I do have free time, but most of my free time is spent on the couch where I work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, watching TV or playing video games. Yeah. That's that's. Stressful at times, I'm assuming. What, playing video games? Uh, yeah. Far obviously. Cry 5 is intense. It looks good. Love killing all the man bun having hipster cult yeah. members on that show. <laughs> I show? saw an Easter egg for Game. the ending. Have you gotten to the ending yet? No. Uh, should, should I, I am stringing it out because it's like savoring a fine wine. Although I, I, I did just compare a video game to a fine wine. I can't play it for like hours and hours because if I beat the game, then I'm going to have nothing to look forward to on yeah, a break. That's true. Usually on a break, it would be like, I'm going to watch television. But in my line of work, I can't watch television on my break because what I do for a living is watch television. And it just like clogs the brain. I'm trying to get the PS4 Pro so I can play. I didn't the, even know there was such a thing. Yeah, it's for 4K. Uh, oh, yeah. Must be nice. Go ahead, continue. Yeah, yeah, get that Shondaland money, bro. Hey, I don't know if I'm going to get a second season. I'm going to spend all my money. <laughs> yeah, it's what I did, and then I ended up on unemployment and working really shitty jobs, slinging coffee to rich people. Yeah, sad. There was a time, I think I told you this, I was working at Starbucks, and I had to serve coffee to my former cast member from VR Troopers. Yeah, yeah, I remember the yeah. story. Stupid. That's got to be uncomfortable. I've had that when I was... Uh, when I was working on Awkward, it was just a recurring guest star. I wasn't on every episode, but I had to still serve tables. And so I was serving tables and being recognized from the show. Oh, God, so that was I a little weird. Tables. And then one – one, she was with her daughters, and the mom goes, wait a minute. Why are you still serving tables if you're working on TV? And I'm like, lady, why do you think – what I said earlier about having a bad experience with children, when I was on VR Troopers, I got attacked by, like, five kids. I went to a friend's um, high school football game, and I was recognized, and I got attacked. Like, kids were kicking me. This one kid jumped on my back. This girl put her hand down my pants because she was looking for money. 
What? Because obviously I was rich because now I was on television. That is insane. Yeah. In your pocket or like down your pants? I think she was trying for my pocket. Oh. <laughs> yep. Front or back? Front. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, she tried. She's bold. Yep. She a little crazy? She was little. Yeah. And I was just like, Oh, kids. you mean like little, little? Yes. Oh my kids. gosh! I'm thinking like no, like, like, no. Kids were just all over me. They either wanted to kick me, punch me, or like dude. wanted money from me. So like, I understand that whole. Although it's a little different, but I understand the whole like. Well, you're on TV now. I mean, you know, when I booked this job, I was like, I'm gonna go get an apartment in this fancy place. And oh shit, that's uh, yeah. Didn't no. work out. No. <laughs> Cause, you know, learned really quickly that shows can die really fast. Yeah. I mean, now I'm I'm kind of in a weird state. I'm in limbo right now because I, I can't. I don't How low know. can you go? Uh, I, I mean, not that low. Actually, I could go pretty low. Not with my knee right now. It fucking sucks. Uh, I think I have runner's knee. Anyway, uh, I'm waiting to wait till May for upfronts and see what shows got picked up to see if we get a season two. Mm. So it's like things are slow. Is right it now. weird now? Even though, I mean, is that weird knowing that Shonda Rhimes has moved on to Netflix? No. It is what it is. I'm a, I'm way maybe too laid back about this kind of stuff. The things I can't control, I've kind of I accepted in my life. Like, yeah, I, I can't control that. That's not too laid back. That's actually good because that's a good way of handling rejection and failure. You know, I've been recently trying my best to look at failure as lessons yeah. as opposed to just, like, knocking you down. That's uh, the way it should be. Yeah, well – Growing up here and, like, going out and auditioning and not getting stuff, it was a blow to the ego. It's, yeah. an, it's an easy blow to the ego. But ha- learning how to handle that and move on, be like, I did this. This was a great experience. This is a stepping stone for me to get to that next thing. That's not how I used to look at things. Now I'm really, like, I'm here right now because of all the choices that, I, that I've made, whether they were good or bad choices in my career. It's led me to this point. And I've learned over the years that whether it is commercial acting or writing scripts or being a journalist or being a podcast host the one, or, or even copywriting for advertising, the one thing it all has in common is storytelling to an audience. It goes back to fucking accountability too, man. You know what I mean? That's, that's something where I've realized that not a lot of people do when they first move out here. And I started to feel that maybe like a few years into it. Where how long have you been out here? Eight and a half years. Ah. Yeah. You know how long I've been out here for? Uh, no. 41. No way. Really? Yeah, I said I was born here. <laughs> in this studio. Oh, you don't look 41. You're 41? Yes, I'm going to be 42 in June. Jeez, you don't look 42 at all. Or 41. Yeah, good job. A lot older than you. Yeah. I'm sure if you shaved, you'd look young even I w- Yes, I would. And then my wife wouldn't touch me. Oh, she likes the beard. I, I like to I like to equate this to – so I used to have a lot of <laughs> – I used you. to have a lot of cats growing up, and it's kind of like – when what? so I had to no, just go with me here because I, I really like this this analogy. I had um, multiple cats at one time, and when the one cat would go off to the the pet hospital to get like a procedure, they'd come back partly shaved and smelling like antiseptic and like medical stuff. Okay. The first time I shaved my face, my wife came home and she reacted to me the way the other cat at home reacted to the cat that would come back from the pet hospital, like not sure how to approach, like you smell weird and your hair's missing. And are you the same? Like, I think you're the same person, but I'm just going to lay back a bit and just observe you from afar. Like she didn't like it. No, she did not. She was like, Oh, <laughs> she comes in with his face. Oh, um, how long does it take to grow that back? And well, you got married to the, the, the man, not the beard. Like, so, but but also I have learned – I grew this beard in 2008, and I have learned that it is like – like I've heard many times before, beards are like makeup for men, and I look better with one than without. Okay. That's – I'm kind of jealous of the amount of facial hair you can grow because this – I mean it doesn't get much thicker than that. This me. is uh, because of VR Troopers. When I was a kid – I didn't grow facial hair, but every time you go on to set, like you go into makeup, hair and makeup, they would f- shave my face, and they promoted hair growth that was not <laughs> there. So I blame that on a TV show I was on in 1994. Man, where probably just genetics, you're get, still, right? <laughs> you're reaping the benefits from it. Think about that. VR Troopers got you your wife. Then VR Troopers got me this podcast. Then. Yeah. VR Troopers got me my car then, which is not true. But, I, I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying is, like, all the steps you take. Like, 
You know, even the fuck up. I think that's that. the start of my midlife crisis to start really identifying the connective nature of all of my collective failures and missteps taking me to the point that I'm at right now. Well, think about it like this, man. What's the alternative? Death. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. No, seriously. What's the alternative uh, for people who are like stuck in a fucking shitty situation right now? To stay and wallow in that situation or to make – deal with the cards you're dealt, even if it's your fault, some of those cards. But see, have, that's yeah. just it. And that's where I was at in high school yeah. where I wanted to stay and wallow because that was – there's something comfortable about being miserable and depressed and really sitting in it. But also you get to this point where you're like, I really want to go outside, but I don't want to go outside. I want to get off this couch. But I can't get off this couch. And that part of it is that mental capacity to know and identify, oh, shit, I'm in a depressed state and I need help and I need to take control of this or be accountable Yeah, and change the narrative. At the time I was so stuck in it, there was no w- capability for me to step back and process and observe. Right. It was just I had to change my environment in order to change the narrative. And changing my environment was surrounding myself with people that supported me. So I get what you're saying. There's, there's but there's a there's, – I'm sorry for interrupting. No, but no, there's, there's like a um, – I'm trying to figure out the right word for this. But like I hate seeing people like say there's no such thing as mental illness or, oh, you're sad, you're depressed, just – step up you know uh pull yourself up by your bootstraps go outside and change it it's not as easy to do when you're stuck in it because it's not coming from a logical place it's coming from an emotional place that drives the you know whatever imbalance or emotional issue you have that's driving the car so i hate hearing that from people who haven't necessarily gone through it because they, they don't know or they're not speaking from that sort of experience i can only speak from my personal experience. I'm not saying I hate you. I'm just saying. No, no, I, I, totally, I, I totally get that. I mean, just, I do, but I'm not saying it. I can barely stand you, but, you know, I'm just here for ratings. Yeah. So. <laughs> you must get really good listenership. Oh, you, dude, it's the fucking roof. Yeah, we have a million hits on the one episode. No, yeah. I'm kidding. Could you, could you imagine? <laughs> get that, get that we Shonda have 10, Rhymes what is it, 20 million hits? Uh, 20 million listeners? On, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, what I was saying was this. <laughs> yes. Um. I can only speak from my experiences and from the way I've found success and improvement in my life. I tend to look at what other successful people are doing and in the beginning stages of whatever that is, just totally chameleon them, copy them completely. Like whatever steps they're taking, copy those steps and change and adjust and recalibrate to my life and what I need for my goals. Now, in terms of like um, – because I had really bad anxiety, really bad anxiety, and um, had my like first like anxiety attacks in 2016, and a lot of bad things were happening all at once. And what I found helped me get through those moments. It were little tiny victories that accumulated. So like, I was like, shit, I gotta go. I, I need to go hike. I need to go do something physical. Maybe that'll help. Release. That's one of the things that I have to do constantly is get out of the house and yes. do something outside. Even if it's, if it's like a walk yeah. around your neighborhood, just yeah. get out of the home, get yeah. out of the house a little bit. Um, th- the the little victories, setting my alarm. Okay, I didn't hit snooze. Great, I woke up. Okay, the next victory, just get out of bed. Okay, next one. Awesome, I did this one. Go wash your face. Great, I'm, I'm there. I, I washed my face. So happy you washed your face. It, right? No, seriously, because if I can get there <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm a little bit awake. I'm there. Awesome. Now just put on your fucking running shoes. Great. Get in the car. It's, and, and then make it to the mountain. Don't even think about climbing the mountain because at that point when the anxiety is hitting you and you've got all these problems in your life, that's just going to make you not go to the mountain and make you not do that thing. But at the end of the day or at the end of the morning when, when I've accomplished all that stuff, and I, again, I'm just speaking from my experiences, that to me was like a, the biggest middle finger to anxiety going, despite how this thing was making me feel, I still went and accomplished something that was very difficult. That empowered me and gave me confidence yeah. to tackle the next obstacle like i got up this morning at 9 40 and i got out of bed and got in the shower as opposed to texting you saying bro not gonna make it oh my gosh (laughs) that no but like 
like uh, this is something that that my wife and I talk about a lot because she also had her own lack of a support system at certain points in her life. Yeah, where uh, I get to this point where I just don't give a shit anymore. This is in the sense that if you're trying to make it in this business or you're just trying to make it in a creative business or whatever, you have to stop worrying about how other people are going to think or feel about something and know that you are confident enough that you are selling some sort of product that you know other people need. So like the worst thing that I can be hit mm. with is if I ask someone to come on my show who is a really big star and they say no, okay, well, I'm glad I asked. If, uh, if I want to be an actor, I'm going to print out my headshots and put together a press kit and send it out send it out to as many agents and managers as possible. It's a numbers game, but it's also a confidence game in knowing that I'm worth it. You know, Absolutely. I have I have a sense of value and worth in this industry, but that has to start from you. And that is something I've learned over time where now I get to a point where I'm like, I don't give a shit if this comes off as me bothering you. If you're an agent, you're in the business to accept submissions in some way or another. Actors are going to be coming at you. And it is my job as an actor to try to cut through the bullshit to get your attention. And I think that that works uh, it, that can work in any any business, any uh, creative outlet you're trying, any lifestyle. And that she and I were reading together this this like not self improvement book or whatever, talking about how a person's relationship, like a person's psychological relationship with money, affects the amount of money that they make. And I grew up with a specific way of viewing money as in we were always broke, we could never afford anything, we always ordered the cheapest thing on the menu, um, I didn't have the cool clothes like the kids did at school, I had hand-me-downs and like, you know, I dressed like I was poor because I was poor, but also there was that poor mindset. Right. And when you start changing that mindset of – just because you've lived through that doesn't mean that that is who you are and that's that you should identify as that if you think of yourself a, di a specific way. If you, you know, follow and mirror other people like you were talking about, it's kind of like that fake it till you make it, that that behavioral um, – those behavioral choices, you do those until they become habit. Once they become habit, they become who you are. They become a part of your identity. So like – absolutely. You know, that's that's something that especially money wise, like we're it's something that we're constantly talking about. I'll still say, oh, I can't afford this. And my wife will get pissed at me and be like, you can afford it. You have the money saved for it. But it's just you don't want to use your money for that. So maybe instead of saying I can't afford it, say I don't have the money for that right now. You, you know, and that comes back to the importance of words and how you use your words to communicate. Absolutely, and I and I love that mindset. I began looking at money as a tool, instead of something to accumulate, and I that might be along maybe the same lines as what you're yeah, doing. Because yeah. Because when I think of money now, it's like, okay, yes, I was on a show, a TV show. We got one season in. I've I've got some cash to sit on. Awesome. Not rich, but I'm comfortable for now. What am I gonna do? Keep kind of hoarding that cash and just like be really frugal. Like I gotta make this last. I gotta make this last. I don't think that is healthy if you're going to that extreme changing it up for me what works is every time i've reinvested in myself reinvested in things that would better my craft uh and better my well-being and of course you can't go i'm gonna i'm gonna buy a tesla today that'll of course that'll make you if feel you're good, elon but, musk you'll send it off into space right but i found i've always gotten amazing returns whenever I invest back into myself, into my craft. Yeah. And so my relationship with money now is even if it's I get a lot or whatever it is, if it costs a lot, I always look at it as a tool. Is this tool going to benefit me for the future? And that's that, it almost feels like a weight has lifted whenever sure. you start thinking of it like right. that. Right, right. And it's something that I have still tried to convince my mother of. I, my mom's birthday is coming up, and I asked her what does she want for her birthday. And it was a similar reaction that just there are still times where I'm like, just fucking answer the question. I invite we invited her over for Passover dinner. And she's like, well, if it's an inconvenience, you know, just to, just do the Jewish thing a little bit less. It's fine. If it's an inconvenience, I understand. I'm like, hey, first off, if it was an inconvenience, I wouldn't have just called you to invite you. Yeah. 
Secondly, just accept the goddamn invite without putting that nugget of guilt in my head. But, like, her birthday's coming up. So I asked, what do you want? I don't know. Just make a list. But I don't know. Just make a list of what you want in life. And maybe it's an experience or a place to go or something that you are given. She's like, yeah, but, you know, earlier in the year you said you couldn't afford to to get a ticket to a play. And I'm like, no, I said I didn't have the money for it. And this was like $400 to go to a play, which I didn't have the money uh, for three for three people. Oh, the, God. I was and like, I'm like, ticket? Mom, that, that was just not in the budget. I, but, you know, I said to her, you raised me a specific way that I am trying not to dictate or live my life by, where I don't want to be the victim behind certain monetary limitations, where, again, I'm going to ask you, what do you want? Give me a list. My wife and I will be able to tell you what is doable and what isn't. That is not for you to say. I am inviting you to tell me. What gifts you would like for your 71st birthday, the last thing I need for you to do is be like, well, I feel guilty because I don't want to inconvenience you. And I'm like, yeah. if that was going to be – it's like she'll call me on the phone and I'll answer the phone and she was like, well, I don't mean to bother you. And I'll be like, if you were bothering me, I wouldn't answer the phone. Like it's simple things like that. Okay. Can I tell you a story? I, it's your show. You can tell me whatever. Oh, my God. Clever Aaron. No. <laughs> the years of experience. Um, so my parents are – we've kind of – we're going through this phase where um, our relationship is kind of shifting from parent to uh, child to uh, reversing that a little bit in certain areas. And then we've got oh, friends. I'm very familiar. Yeah. Um, so my uncle came and visited uh, a couple weeks ago, and he got to witness a tech support call from my mother. And uh, from your mother? Yeah, she's asking me for tech support. Oh, yeah, on her. Oh, phone. she got a new phone. So, oh God! So I'm literally driving on the highway, facetiming with her, and she's facetiming. The You're company. facetiming while driving. Yeah, you are so, not a good example. No, no. Uh, Citizens arrest, man. Citizens arrest. <laughs> so, um, she. Uh, she, kind of young people listening to this show, not a role model. I'm FaceTiming while driving. Like, I was just, I'm just bring my computer in. I'm typing on the. Sorry, I know it's dangerous. Just, I know, whatever. Sure. Anyway, so my uncle got to witness me uh, starting to lose my patience with uh, my parents. And I was just getting frustrated. They had forgotten their passwords or something like that. Anyway, afterwards, he tells me this great story. And it really resonated with me. And I hope it resonates with you. And I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're. Very nice with your mom. I'm sure you're uberly patient. <laughs> and, We've had um, a history. but I, I'm trying. This has helped me become more empathetic with them. So the story is this. So this old man is with his son. His son is in his like you know late 30s, the old, and the old man is old. And he's uh, he sees a bird start jumping in front of him, and he says, uh, hey, what what is that? And his son goes, that, that's a bird. That. And he's like, oh. And then a couple of minutes go by, and he points to the bird again. He's like, hey, what is that? He's like, that it's a bird. He's like, okay. Hey, what, what do you call that? He's like, Dad, it's a fucking bird. It's a bird. And he's like, okay, okay, sorry. So the dad passes away uh, a couple years later. Oh, God, he killed his dad because of the bird. No. Uh, and he's going through his stuff, and, uh, and he finds, like, this journal that his dad would keep. And he finds uh, – he's, like, reading through the package, passages, and one of the passages is from the day he starts uh, – asking his son about the bird and he what he finds out in his in the passage it reads um, today uh, I asked my son uh, you know I pointed to a bird and asked him what it was and he got mad at me after I asked him three times and um, I don't know why he got so mad at me because I remember when he was a little kid he asked me what that thing was and it was a bird but he asked me 30 ah. he asked me 32 <laughs> times yeah. And each time, it just made me happy, and it just filled me with so much love whenever he would ask me every single time. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Just that story made me be – I don't know. It just made me want to be more patient yeah, but, with my family. Yeah, and, but as an old man, you have that info, unless if you've got Alzheimer's. 
you yes. know, as a kid, you're constantly learning. I get, I okay. get the point. Yeah, you get the the message. I'm at it. a point now where, when my grandmother passed away, yeah. I said to my mother, "I'm like, I'm going to point out to you, we we made this promise. Mm. Whenever she started behaving like my grandmother, I would point it out because my grandmother did, was was you know the the accident changed her, and she became a very angry, negative, grumpy person. My mom didn't want to be that, but to really help. Yeah. That move along, I kind of had to put my own self in check because, I, as you can see, I'm a sarcastic asshole. Yeah. Um, the greatest kind, though. Like, I don't smell bad at all. Uh, sorry, really bad joke. P- bringing it back to the brown noise. Um, so recently, like, when, when my mom first got email, I can't even tell you how many times I had to remind her the email is not on the computer. Like, you're not just going to turn your computer on and your email is going to be there on your desktop. Mm. And it got her so frustrated because growing up, it reminded her of how we had to teach my grandmother over and over again how to program the VCR to record a TV show. (laughs) Where it was so easy for us, but she wasn't grasping. Right, right, right. And I still go through this with my mother. She has an Amazon Fire Stick that I got her. Yeah. I don't use an Amazon Fire Stick. I don't know the functionality of an Amazon Fire Stick. But because I bought it for her, I'm tech support. So if something's not working on it, she calls me. Yeah. And then I have to go to Google and start <laughs> trying to to figure it out, even though she has... A laptop at home and Wi-Fi where she can go to Google. And then in turn, I find stuff. I email her. She then calls me back and reads through the email I sent her to try to walk through it on the phone. It's kind of a convoluted process. But, I I mean, it's at a point now where I am starting to really accept that she's going to get certain things and it's not going to get other things. And there's kind of that 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 generational disconnect between what they were used to at a specific time. And like, I don't understand Snapchat. That's something where I'm like, I just don't fucking get that. Like, what's the point of that? You know, where I'm that guy now, you know, um, PlayStation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Four plus. What? You know, I definitely wasn't saying you're not, I'm, Again, I don't know what, how you react with it, but I'm saying no, 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 or anything like no, that, no. But, but I'm saying I'm trying more so to be, yeah, because it would it's get right. to a point where like I'd repeat myself and repeat myself, and it would almost be like I'm back at my job, yeah, trying to explain to someone over the phone, but it's my mother, and I like after a point, I'm like, you are not listening to what I am saying, yeah. But then you do that, then your ego is getting in the way, and it's not about I... your experience, you know. It's about yeah, trying I I to help someone else. Yeah. I, I guess I just don't want to have regret, you know, looking back. I want to try to be as patient as possible. I know I won't be perfect every single time because, you know, there will be that time where they're not here anymore. And so for me, I'm always trying to be like, okay, remember these times. Remember these times because you're going to wish you had that opportunity in the future maybe to call her up one day and you won't be able to. That's, that's what makes me try and have so much more empathy and I always try to share that with people who deal with that because tech support is extremely frustrating, especially with my parents, when they're literally using their FaceTime camera to show me something on their computer. <laughs> and my mom's holding the camera. For, and My, my mom doesn't phone. even have a smartphone. I will not. Oh, really? Uh, I mean, she's on a fixed income. Yeah. And she's disabled. Gotcha. So, and I kind of have um, uh, symptoms of what she has yeah. in her hands, so it's hard for her to type. Ah, Gotcha. And I'm like, we can't afford to get you a smartphone. Yeah, it'd be a little challenging. And also, I can't afford the the emotional equity space to be able to teach my mom how to text message. <laughs> like, I don't even. I uh, no. My brother and I were in tears when because we I have iPhones and my dad has iPhones too, and he got so. Uh, he got so frustrated with the iPhone that he's like, you know what? I just want to – I'm just going to get Samsung. We're just going to get Samsung. Oh, what is his accent? Oh, we're from Syria. Really? Yeah. I was born there. Really? Yeah. Wow. Fuck. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so – I'm so happy that this whole time this has not been a political conversation, but fuck, Yeah, dude. me neither. Uh, anyway, um, so he was like, Let, I'm going to get a Samsung. I'm like, dad – if you get a Samsung, I won't be able to help you because I don't even know how to – yeah, I don't know how that works. 
I, uh, I only know I used iPhone. To, and I used Apple to have an products. iPhone, and I moved over to Samsung in 2015. Yeah. yeah, it's more customizable, and it's more like you know. It got to a point where I'm like, really, Apple? I have to buy all of your products yeah. to make it work, and like, you know, I don't know when when you learn about um, that, like the Malaysia sweatshop sort of uh third world country way in which apple existed uh overseas like at that point i'm like okay i have a macbook <laughs> and that's where i'm stopping you can't tell me what kind of phone and at the time when i i got uh samsung i think it was a galaxy s4 or s5 you could take the back the back of the phone off and upgrade the memory yourself by putting in a new chip and it was really customizable in that sense where uh the apple iphone didn't have that they have since stopped doing that but that's what really drew me to the samsung that's, that's fine but like everything has that like I'm not judging you child labor or like yeah no i i work it was just conditions like anything technological with technological. just just with apple with mac it just felt like just like what i was saying earlier about going to get this fucking iced coffee in a jar and because they served it in a jar it was like we're Better than, than the iced coffee. I don't know. There was something about it where I was like, fuck you. <laughs> we are fucking up this world so bad. Like, no joke. It, and this is really dark. Uh, I, I don't know what the solution is to fix it. It might be Armageddon. It might be a reset switch, a reset button. I was Seriously, watching uh, so fucked up. No, Lost no. in Space. The, the new the new Lost in Space on, on Netflix. It's, oh, a, yeah. it's the remake of the classic sci-fi show. They just left the planet. They just, uh, they just evacuated <laughs> <laughs> Was so, it a fucking whale just washed ashore? They found sixty-seven pounds of plastic in its stomach. Sure, sure. Like, like, literally, our plastic is literally just flooding into the ocean. That's nothing new. Jesus Christ, dude! Thank you, by the way, for the plastic bottle of water. I appreciate. Yeah, because um, you know our fil- or what is yeah. it? The uh, tap water isn't great. You know, I uh, my wife no longer lets me buy plastic bottles. We have our own reusable bottles at home. The whole the, the whole BPA thing. You know how plastic can like get yep. whatever chemicals Wait, or whatever. What do you your... refill it with? We have uh, one of those uh, filter Brita uh, things, uh, faucet okay. attachment thingies. Yeah, does it work well? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. What? How do we know? But but you get to a point now where I feel like uh, they proved recently that LA tap water is just as healthy for you as bottled water now. Oh, would you read that recently? Yeah. Okay, I gotta check that out. I don't know if it was a reputable news okay. source. See, that's what I'm always scared but, of. But, I mean, I used to drink tap water when I was a kid, and I'm from here, and, you know. Look at me now! <laughs> I'm really embracing the dad aesthetic, by the way. with the, Super, super dad. Yeah. The hat. Actually, Tom Verico came in, I think, last week with that hat. Yeah, like a similar hat. Yeah, well. Yeah. It's a good hat. Thank you. It's a good hat. I have a giant head. It's hard to, it's hard to find hats that fit me. Yeah. Funny enough, I'm wearing my dad's hat right now. Oh my gosh! From when he was he worked as an airplane engineer in uh, New York for Eastern Airlines. Do you remember that airlines? Yes. Yeah, I'm wearing my dad's. Yes, hat. it's very hipster on you. How I'm old just... are you? How old are you, Wee Sam? I'm 30. See, see, told you I was older. Yeah. 30 years old. I thought you were in do your you, 30s. Do you remember Eastern Airlines? Yeah. 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 How I... is it being 30? Uh, it's good. You know what? It's good. I'm really thankful. I have a lot of things to be thankful for. Um, yeah, I'm not to say I don't have any struggles or obstacles, but um, it's going great, man. I should never ever complain ever. No one should. Yeah. Be- you know, my wife recently she I forget what uh, monthly blessings. She has this folder, and I opened the folder, and it was just bills. And I'm like, what? She's like, yes, but. If you become thankful for the service you're paying for as opposed to looking at it as a burden. Oh, fucking genius. You know, she's like, I pay this amount of money to be able to have a means to travel from my home to my work. I pay this amount of money to ensure that we have a roof over our head and I can sleep safe at night and whatever. And I'm like, that is such a good attitude. Seriously, I I get excited when I hear stuff like that new when I'm like, see – when it goes. It the... goes back to the importance of words and communication. Can we get his wife on the podcast, Michael? Yeah, she'll come in, dude. No, seriously. Um, that is. If she comes in, it's going to be all like, like, 
you know, life coach stuff because she really wants to do that, which I think you would bond well with. She I also think, think did the voiceover uh, announcement for my show, the intro. Oh, you have a show? Yeah, it's called Pruner TV. It's at Adobe <laughs> Radio on Tuesdays, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. Right in time for your drive time commute. Oh, we're, we've got the Thursday time slot of that. Yes, I'm aware. Yeah. I think we had this discussion. Yes, before. we did. Yeah. I, I, and you were confused. Was I? Yes. You were like, no, I'm Thursday. I'm like, yes, but we had the same time slot. I'm on Tuesday. You were like, yeah, but I'm not on Tuesday. I'm like, yes, who's on first, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. You just weren't clear enough. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> um, God damn it. Aaron, you're such an interesting cat, dude. I am a cat. You really are. That came home shaved from the hospital and smelled bad. And your wife didn't like that. No. I tried a mustache once. Oh, God. She didn't like that? No, but it was not. Like, I have a, I don't have the appropriate shape of a face for a good mustache. I looked like, um, I looked like a Keystone cop from like a 70s French film. (laughs) If that could even, if that even like, I don't even know if that works in your head. But I like my like I tried to end it right where my lips ended, and then I tried the whole handlebar thing because yeah. my dad was was friends with the Hell's Angels, and I like I never like met any of that. But I I was like you know I like certain kinds of music. Where I'm like yeah I'm gonna do the handle. No, no, no man. Have you ever thought of like uh, just mutton chops? Go like I know, had mutton chops for a long time. No, no mustache or this part. No, I, like, well side bur- sideburns. I had yeah, sideburns. Big ones. I had Vince Vaughn style. Like there was there was a point in time where I would get out for auditions and they would say Vince Vaughn type, and I would usually, you know, after I stopped is, looking like Ben Stiller. Since you do a lot of TV, and do you do film at all on your show or just TV? Uh, I don't really do film unless if it's like a movie that is a Netflix movie. Because I consider Netflix movies TV. Really? Uh, like Steven Spielberg recently said, Netflix movies should not be nominated for Oscars because they are presented on a TV platform. That's how I I, I, uh, I believe that, and a lot of people probably disagree. But um, Interesting. Interesting. I, I went and saw A Quiet Place, and I talked about it on the show because John Krasinski was a comedic TV actor, and he co-wrote and stars and directed the movie. Yeah. And it was a, uh, it was great. Just like, and I compared it to Get Out, a horror movie directed, written by a former TV comedic actor. So, like, I'll talk about stuff like that here and there, but it's mostly TV stuff. Gotcha. Why do you ask? I was just curious what your favorite uh, film or TV show was. My favorite film, The Shining. Really? And I, okay. I just wrote a thing about it for Looper, where I had to do some research. It was like all the ways The Shining changed horror, and people didn't notice. Uh, yeah, the shine, and I think I got introduced to horror really at a really young age. My mom and grandmother used to go to the market for like four hours on the weekend because it was like the only time my grandmother could get out of the house. So she would have to touch every piece of produce possible at the market. Um, and sometimes I would go and sometimes I would stay home. And I stayed home one weekend watching KTLA Channel 5 on like a Sunday. And The Shining was on. And here I am. I'm a little kid. And at the time, I really liked uh, putting together, like, model cars. Like, yeah, model toy cars where you, like, put them together. And I got stuck in front of the TV watching this thing. And it really left a mark in me. And the, growing up, I've come back to the movie time and again. And it, I just feel like it's such a brilliant piece of work on so many levels. Okay. And so that's my favorite movie of all time. TV show? That is a difficult question to answer. You know, working in this, uh, my immediate, my immediate answer goes to I Love Lucy or MASH. Okay. But I got a soft spot for uh, The Wire and Breaking Bad. Still haven't seen The Wire. Yeah. No, I missed that train. Missed it. You didn't miss it. I mean, it's you can watch every. No, episode. they wouldn't let me. Oh, the internet. So it was an actual it. train. <laughs> <laughs> Last call, the wire train, straight from here to Bodymore, Maryland. Right. No, that's really interesting. My, I like uh, Red Belt. Was my favorite movie. David Mamet directed and wrote it. Oh, you're 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 really getting like like. 
I don't know where I'm going with my talking, <laughs> but you say David Mamet, and I think, oh, oh, oh. Not yeah. a lot of people like him. Oh, David Mamet. Not a lot of people like him, uh, which un- understandable. Some, uh, yeah. But Red Belt for me. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No. I get excited when somebody else has seen it. But yeah, David Mamet, uh, Red Belt. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like my favorite TV show of all time. It's so hard working in this industry to even pick. But like currently, right now, what's on like Legion? I'm I'm super excited for that. Um, Westworld was great. The commercial for Legion looks fucking scary. It's a great show. It's wow. it's unlike anything else on TV. It's unlike any other comic book show on TV. Man, FX they are they are the sh- the network to go to if you want to make a really cool and different TV show. Atlanta is a perfect. Uh, oh, I have example. I, I'm of starting that. that this week sometime. Ooh, I can't wait. What? You're the worst. Yep. Yep, uh, it's like they're disrupting, kind of like like what Netflix does. FX is kind of doing for a while. Their FX and AMC were going hand in hand, like like they were tied with content. But AMC is now. Uh, when I went to the Television Critics Association thing for AMC, they are now advertising like Better Call Saul and uh, The Terror and The Walking Dead, like all the stuff that's on their channel. Uh, Into the Badlands, I'm going to have the the showrunners of that on my show in a few weeks. They're calling it prestige popcorn, quote unquote, as opposed to uh, FX. They turn they they coined the term peak TV, which is something that it is has been uh, claimed in ownership by all sorts of journalists, referring to the amount of TV content that is out there right now. We are at peak TV, you know, like. Netflix was doing something like 700 original shows and movies this past year, but (laughs) AMC called it prestige popcorn in the sense that it's like heightened uh, blockbuster fun movie type of entertainment. I guess because now that Breaking Bad and Mad Men are no longer on the air, they're no longer being considered really for Emmys. Yes, Better Call Saul has gotten nominations, but it's like, well... We're just, you know, we're uh, the cheesy stuff that you like to just go to the movies and eat popcorn and watch without, like... So weird. Did they have a the executive change up there? Yeah, I mean, that I, I don't know. Yes, actually. Yes. I think, uh, if I remember, and I could be wrong, but I think the head of AMC moved over to Hulu to head up their programming at Hulu. Well, look at Hulu now. I know. I know. Dude. This is so interesting to me because now since being on a you know network TV show and learning more about the executive executives of you know TV programming, their world, their business, what are their motives, what are their goals, um, it's so interesting how each network, how much they have put creative control in from like the executive sides and the notes from the up top. And, and that versus... growing trend of, of bringing people like Ryan Murphy or Jordan Peele or Donald Glover or – Shonda Rhimes to create overall deals for them to make whatever shows on that specific, like Noah Hawley, who does Legion, he has an overall development deal with FX to do stuff with FX. Same with Ryan Murphy, but Ryan Murphy's now with uh, Netflix, you know, Mm -hmm. where his deal, $300 million to just create stuff for, for, for Netflix. It never really used to be that way aside from people like Stephen J. Cannell and Dick Wolf, you know, in the 80s and 90s doing all of their procedural shows that were on TV. Now it's just like we're investing in the showrunner as opposed to investing in just the TV show, which is weird. There there was that, once again, bringing it back to Lost. Lost was the first uh, show in the new millennium that ended up making the showrunners stars because Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse they became the faces of the show. They did. They they were the ones who did the podcast. They were the ones in like the Easter eggs and the videos online where they kind of became as famous as their cast. And then you had people like um, forget the guy's name from Sons of Anarchy. Uh, the Kurt Sutter. Yes, him. Where it starts being like it's not just about the show and its cast. It's also about the people who are like helming the thing yeah because they have a lot of control over it you know what i mean it never used to be that way though yeah and i i'm not a firm believer of the too many cooks in a kitchen kind of uh way of doing things where you have 
so many people putting in their input and this needs to be changed, this needs to be changed, this needs to be changed. I, I just don't think that's a good idea. I think you need to – what they're doing right now because it's pretty yeah. successful with the kind of content that they're producing is you need to invest in the – like you're saying, the showrunner, the creative, the creator of this. There these is because, a huge disconnect between creative and corporate. Yes, and and <laughs> – I mean, you just see the difference between companies who do do that and companies who don't. Um, it's just it does it never works. I mean, when you have like six leaders, I mean, you don't know what you're doing. I don't know. I just it just kind of, I know it is what it is. Um, but again, it still works that way on network TV. But I think for the most part, the cable model is is going in that. Like what Vince Gilligan? I mean, you got to start. He cut his teeth writing on the X Files, but. Breaking Bad, like that Matthew Weiner for Mad Men, like you start really, you start really seeing a shift in how entertainment is being looked at mm. because it's coming from these notable names who have this experience under their belt, and you know, especially, I mean, Ryan Murphy is a perfect example of that, or Greg Berlanti on on the CW with all the superhero shows, where it's like it's almost like that name um, conjures up so many things yeah. and so many expectations at the same point and also reputation you know ryan murphy his shows are good but also kind of schlocky and and trashy in a way uh, there are certain like american horror story as cutting edge and edgy as the show can be it's still kind of glam and trashy and ryan murphy mm-hmm. has that specific voice yeah. that is kind of ex- like you watch 911 on fox it's a little trashy like but it's it's the kind of trash that people are constantly tuning in for so he's tapped into what works and that formula where like he's going to netflix he's doing that one flew over the cuckoo's nest prequel series nurse ratchet starring sarah paulson and i'm like one flew over the cuckoo's nest is in my top five favorite movies of all time i will watch that sure yeah i don't know how exactly they'll focus on the canon do you, and and how true it'll be to you know the original story. Do you think? By the way, Milos Forman, the director of uh, When Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, died today. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh wow. So shout out to him. Yeah, I hope his uh, uh, next life is a better one. Once again, we're recording uh, on a Saturday, not the Thursday. This is airing, so I don't want people to be like, "He didn't die today." Yeah, that's true. Um, do you think it's critical the? Um, the surroundings you watch a movie in or a TV show, do you think that affects your, um, the way it affects you? Because here's, I saw a quiet place in the theaters. Um, I really liked the movie. However, I would have liked it 10 times more if I watched it by myself in my home. Seriously? Really? Yes. Because we huh. had people commenting during the last part of it. People making noises. See, that's the problem with going to, what movie theater did you go to? You're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked. I probably am not going to be shocked. The uh, the Lim- Limley. Oh, okay. Which That's is where usually I saw a, a That's nice where I saw play. People were respectful there. People usually don't say shit in that theater. And I was like, awesome. Literally the, the one movie where it needs to be quiet in the theater so you can really. I feel like there are certain movies that uh, have an experiential component that make it more enjoyable. Like seeing Get Out in a movie theater or. There are certain action films or horror films that it's a community experience that that being in a theater with with like minded fans really inform the experience more so than just watching it on your couch in your living room. Um, That, I think, is what separates the experience uh, and the importance of identifying Netflix movies as should be nominated for Emmys and theatrical movies that should be nominated for Oscars because that, I think, is what separates them is the experience of going to a movie theater like for Ready Player. Like, I remember when I was a kid, I would go, like, for Jaws or Star Wars. Like, if Jaws and Star Wars were Netflix movies and you watched them at home, they probably wouldn't have the same impact on pop culture. And I know I'm making references to a specific time when Netflix didn't exist and the internet wasn't a thing. But when you look at it now, more and more, like, well, thank God for movie pass or else I wouldn't go to the movies half the time. But, like, there are so there is so much content out there now to be uh, digested, I guess, consumed, whatever. Um, and there's a lot of great stuff on Netflix, but also there's something about that experience of going out 
and going to a movie theater. Like going to the movies was the next step in going out to a play. You know, back when movies first started, it was like a thing where people got dressed up and went. We don't do that anymore. And unfortunately, people go into a movie theater and treat it like it's their fucking home. And they turn on their phones and they, you know, check text messages. I was in a theater once where this guy would not get off his fucking phone. He was talking on the phone during the movie where it's just, you know, you get this this entitled thing where it's like, well, I spent this amount of money. I'm just going to go in and treat it like it's, you know, it's my own personal space. It drives space. me insane. That's why I prefer to watch movies. I wish I could watch it in a theater by myself. Like, that would be the ultimate dream, to have your own home theater. Oh, that yeah. Would, that would be amazing. I understand. I uh, understand. I just I, – I, here's the thing. I know the amount of work that goes into, like, producing films and TV. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of money. And so I just want to really – pay the appropriate respect to that and it's yeah. so hard for me going to do that in movie theaters because you have people like that and so that's why i think it's really important to see certain films in certain circumstances i know it's not the same but like from my house i have a big enough tv like 55 inches where like okay if i really want to watch a movie i will buy it on amazon whenever it's on amazon prime whatever and just experience that well, at least you're buying it and you're not stealing it you know. yeah i stopped doing that once i could start affording to <laughs> buy, buy, right, buy right. movies and TV shows. Because there's a whole other I'm... conversation of how online piracy is affecting movies and theaters. And, you know, you see, God, like, Universal had Straight Outta Compton and Fast and the Furious. And, like, that year they made so much money. But people don't get that a lot of that money goes back into the system to be able to bring smaller independent films into the theater to give them clout because those independent films – and those smaller art house films is what's usually going to get them awards recognitions. But then you're like, well, they don't, I mean, how's it going to affect them if I steal something where you're not thinking about all these smaller roles involved from the guy that drives the trailer to the editor, to the, the gaffer or whatever else. And it's yeah. like, it really does trickle down. And then that ends up being why there's such a disconnect now in movies where, Every place is looking for that next big franchise to have people invest their time and money in, like, the new Harry Potter or Fantastic Beasts or all these Avengers movies. and Or, like, you know, you always hear about broke box office records because that's, all, that, that's now the event that people want to leave the house and go see. Right, right, right. And they're not wanting to invest anymore in, like, the – what was it you called? Red Bell or Red Belt? Red Belt. You know, I'm assuming that was not a big budget action film. No. no. Right. So, but I mean, there's a place for that, that we need, we need stuff like that. And it's just, it's unfortunate how the, it's unfortunate, but also the way of the game of how, you know, things change and. It's a weird ecosystem that's constantly changing yeah. and it changed dramatically, obviously when streaming hit. And, um, I just, I'm curious to see where it's going to go. Like in another 10 years, especially I, with yeah. like. These companies, like you, you saw when when I heard Disney bought uh, Star Wars, right? In Lucasfilm, Lucasfilms. Yeah. I was like, oh shit, they want to do the theme park thing. They're looking to do yeah. even more money and even yeah. not just films. They're they smart bought, about they that. They bought Lucasfilm and they bought Marvel and they almost were going to buy Netflix, but instead they're now creating their own standalone streaming service that's going to be premiering in 2019. Okay, there you go. Right. So, so it's like. All right. But it's getting to a point now where, like, all these standalone streaming services were coming out as an alternative to cable. Where now there's so many, my, my co host likes to bring this up. He's like, I, it's just going to be a matter of time before all these different standalone services are going to be available under one umbrella, like cable. Because right. you, you end up getting Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and HBO and whatever. And suddenly you're paying for all these different channels where it's like, you're kind of doing what you were doing already, you know? Mm, yeah, that's a really good point. To put it under a magnifying glass on the acting portion, there's been more acting jobs now than ever before, but to make a living as an actor has been in, even harder than it was in the I've past. heard. I've heard. When I was when I was doing it, there was a big shift. You, oh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but when you said you've heard, do you mean you agree or disagree with that? I can either agree nor disagree because I don't get work anymore. So, gotcha. Okay. But I mean, I've heard because there's now so many different places you can get content that because it's such a crowded playing field, 
that, yeah, there's acting work available, but it's not going to pay what it used to pay. And part of that is also that when I was working, there was a big shift in – there was a time when movie actors would not do television. Right, right, right. And right. I know what, there was a big shift where suddenly, like, you would get guest stars like Bruce Willis on Friends or whatever, and more and more big movie actors would come to TV and take those guest star roles. So then – if, if I was being considered for guest star, I would now be bumped down to co-star or uh, or or under five or whatever. And then more and more that was happening and that changed the ecosystem and the hierarchy for, you know, it became harder and harder for unknown people to get a break in bigger roles. And I know that that has since shifted because of the Internet, and web series and YouTube and everything else. But like. I mean that that's that was when I was going out constantly and auditioning, and that was something that I really had to, to understand and know that nine times out of ten I was going to get a part that was just going to have one or two lines, and that was it. Yeah, and that's just a part of the process. That's the ladder that you're climbing. Yeah, Mister Mister Pruner. Hi. It's been uh, it's been over two hours actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just think um, of it this way. You could have spent your time and money on a movie, but instead <laughs> you've stuck listening to me talk. Um, no, seriously. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Seriously, this has been such a great experience for me and so cool to get to know you a little better. Um, I'm I'm just here for you. Really? No. No, I didn't think so. Um, yeah, you're more than welcome to come back anytime you like. Cool. <laughs> I mean, I don't have much going on on Saturday. I'm doing a a, a birthing class with my wife on the weekends. So, okay. But aside from that, I don't really have too much going on because, as I told you when you invited me, I have no social life. Yeah. When you messaged me with that, I was like, oh, okay. Cool. So I'm, I'm basically practicing. Cool. Okay. I'm You're practicing. You know, okay. getting little amounts of sleep and having no social life. That's. I like that. I like that. Um, when is your show air for people listening? Uh, my show Pruner TV which is a name that I did not come up with. That was Brett Davern who came up with that name. Okay. Brett, who used my show as an inspiration to create the Brett Davern show. I don't know if we talked about that enough uh, on this show. Pruner TV airs on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific here at Adobe Radio. And then later on that evening, it goes up on iTunes. Nice. And if people want to follow you on Twitter. Uh, I mean, you, I, if you want, that's cool. <laughs> uh, I'm on Twitter at Aaron Flux. I don't have enough followers at Pruner TV well, on yeah, Twitter. That's what I mean. So you want to, you want people Here's to what Pruner? I need. Here's okay. Let's get into a contract together. We Sam's world listeners. What I need, I need followers at Pruner TV and I need reviews on iTunes. Those are the two things I need in okay. my life. Oh, if we're yeah. really talking about what you could do for me okay. to bring me back to this studio that I was born in in 1976. With farm animals. Uh, it was just a cow farm. Just a cow it farm. Was a, yes. Well, they are technically farm animals. Sure. Yeah. True. <laughs> Michael, yes. let's end this. <laughs> and that's it, ladies and gentlemen. What a crazy cool episode. Uh, no, it was uh, really cool to learn all that uh, all that personal stuff. I'm so glad and thankful that Aaron shared with us. And, um, yeah, it was super awesome having him on the show. Aaron, uh, Aaron's show, Pruner TV, uh, airs on Adobe, 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesdays. Uh, so check out his show. It's pretty awesome. Uh, big thank you to Adobe Radio and Nice Guy Digital. Uh, thank you to uh, you, Michael. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate our social media team as well. Um, they're hanging up a sign outside that fell down. And they are. They might die. They might die. No, they're, they're, they're safe. Um, I hope they're safe because we don't have any insurance. We out! <laughs>